You guys ready to talk about prayer? Yeah. <laughs> You guys are awake. I love it. Matthew chapter 6 today, we're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we start a two-week look at the powerful, life-changing, world-altering practice of private prayer. As I studied prayer these last few weeks, one phrase that kept coming to mind that feels a little cheap, so don't judge me for this, but in many ways... Prayer is the ultimate life hack. You know what I mean by life hack? Right? Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., you're probably going to be at work or at school. Think about where you're going to be. Maybe you're sitting at your desk checking emails, or you're in the middle of a staff meeting, or you're on the playground. Wherever you are, in that moment, at your desk, around the conference table, you, you get this reminder in your heart, in your mind, of someone in your life going through a hard time and you feel burdened, I wanna lift up this request to the Lord. My friend going into surgery today, or my friend with a scary medical diagnosis, or my friend in the season of grief, or my loved one who's battling this or that. And so 10 a.m. tomorrow in your meeting, at your desk, depending on the context, you might even keep your eyes open, pretend like you're listening to your boss, (laughs) where in your heart, you lift up this request to God. No one knows you're doing it. It wasn't a big ordeal. It was 12 seconds of your life. And somehow in those 12 seconds, while you were doing what you were already doing, God saw fit to partner with you and intervene in the world hundreds of miles away sometimes. That's what I mean when I say prayer is the ultimate life hack. It's something that we can step into very easily and see extraordinary results. I was thinking about the power of technology as it relates to prayer. A few weeks back, we had an Easter egg extravaganza coming up. And you know, I could just go to my watch and say, I can't even say her name, she'll start listening, but hey Siri, I can say, Siri, what's the weather going to be like on Saturday for our Easter extravaganza event? And, and Siri said, like she said many years in the past, oh, it's going to be rain on Saturday. Your event's going to be terrible. That's what Siri says. <laughs> and she's the all-knowing, omniscient one in, attached to our wrists. And so it's easy to take her word for it. But instead, we hear this, and so a bunch of us just start praying. God, make it sunny instead of rainy on Saturday. This is like four years in a row. It's supposed to be raining on Saturday. And every year, four years in a row, the prayers change the hand of God and Siri is proven wrong. I don't think there's a battle that needs to be waged between God and Siri. We know who wins that battle. But it's sometimes easy to forget that that our private prayer practice can actually change the world outside of ourselves. And we look at the scriptures, we see in a sense, there's, there's no wrong way to pray. We see Nehemiah shoot up a dart to the Lord before he steps into an important meeting with the king. We see Jacob wrestling with God all night long. We see David pouring out his heart in poetry in the Psalms. We see Hannah going into a place of religious worship and begging God for a son. We see long prayers, short prayers, written prayers, out loud prayers, prayers just in the heart, prayers in public, prayers in private. Part of the application we think about prayer is just do it. That's why I think it's so fascinating that as we walk into Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing that we see is that Jesus expends a lot of energy teaching us how not to pray. He says, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't be like these people. Don't be like these people. Pray differently than these people who are doing it wrong. And so this week, I am going to release you to just go out and pray, and I hope that this message energizes you to do so, but... But before we talk about going out and praying, what we need to spend time with is wrestling with Jesus' words of what could be wrong in our hearts that's hampering or hurting our prayer lives. 
And so we're going to look at what not to do for Matthew chapter 6. So if you've not yet opened your Bible, you can open to Matthew 6 right now. I'm going to read for us Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8, where Jesus tells us what not to do. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do at the dentist's office was not to get cavities filled, but was to sit in the lobby and read the magazines. Highlights magazine, Boys Life magazine. Magazines probably don't exist anymore, but when I was a kid, that's what we had. And, and one of my favorite installments in all of these magazines was a, a little cartoon that would be near the back that was always called, What's Wrong With This Picture? You remember those? It says, there are five errors in this picture. Can you find all of them, right? So you see a picture like this on the screen. This one's way too hard. You'll never get this if you do gold stars in heaven or something. But what's wrong with this picture? And you scrutinize and scan, and eventually you find out the woman with the glasses and the red shirt has two left feet. That's what's wrong with this picture. <laughs> and that's way too hard. That's way too hard. <laughs> Jesus gives us two pictures of prayer in this passage that we read, almost to invite us into critique, to say, what's wrong with this picture of prayer? And today we're gonna address each of them individually and see what he wants us to learn. Now the first picture of prayer that, that Jesus gives us that we have to figure out what's wrong with, we see in verse five, where he talks about hypocrites, religious leaders, and, and he says this, he says, they love to pray Standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. What's wrong with this picture? If you study the context of Jesus' day, you get those two pictures. That in the synagogues, which was where people would gather for religious services, these men would, would love to just get up and, and bring these flowery, flowery prayers to God before other people. They loved it. They loved being an example of, of what to do when it came to prayers. On the street corners, that's a little harder to understand. We, we need to understand that in Jesus' day, they had regular hours of prayer every single day. So there was like a nine o'clock prayer hour, noon per hour, three o'clock, six o'clock per hour, these kinds of things. And, and if you were part of the nation of Israel during that day, whatever you were doing, when that clock struck that time, you would drop everything and you would pray. And so Jesus says, don't be like these men who love to coordinate their schedules so when the prayer clock strikes 12, they just happen to be standing at the busiest intersection of town. And they love to lift up their voice in full hearing of everyone around and show how spiritual they are. Jesus actually comes after these men who practice this often in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives us a kind of an audio recording of, of what one of these prayers could sound like. It says in, in Luke 18, 11 and 12, it says, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Thank you, God, for making me me. I added that last part, I added that last part. This is the first picture of what not to do. So let me ask you, right? You came to the 10 o'clock service because I assume you're already awake today. What do we learn from this passage? What, what are these prayers like? What do you see that's wrong with these stories? Somebody say something. Boastful? Boastful? Yeah, what else? Self-righteous, Self focus, what were you gonna say? Focus was on himself. 
Yeah, part of what I, I noticed when I read that Luke 18 prayer the first time was that it's not even technically a prayer, right? The word pray in the Greek language means ask. So really, a prayer can be anything as long as you're asking God for something, right? And there's also, you can praise God, you can give thanks. But if you're praying, you're asking God for something. Luke 18, the, the religious leader does not ask God for anything. He just tells God a bunch of great stuff about himself. If I'd encapsulate what Jesus is trying to draw out for us by, by looking at just this little glimpse of what not to do, I would say that Jesus is trying to warn his audience that we can be tempted to turn our prayers into a performance. If you're taking notes today, that's the first blank you can fill in. We can be tempted to turn our prayers into a performance. And we've said this several times in this series here, I, I don't think that the people who were listening to the Sermon on the Mount were the ones standing on the street corners praying. I don't think those were the ones who were boastful and wearing the big religious garments. It sounds like it was the every person was who was listening to Jesus. And so on one hand, he's saying, don't let these men be your role models. And on the other hand, I think what he's saying over and over again in Matthew 5 and Matthew chapter 6 specifically is to be careful because the seed of sin that grows into something as ugly as that guy, that guy's practice, I don't know if he's ugly or not, that guy's practice, that seed of sin exists in all of our hearts. And so even though you might not be standing on street corners, even though you might not be boastfully praying before religious people, there's something in us that is tempted to turn our prayers into a performance. And this could look a number of different ways. Some of us might be tempted in a small group context here at the church to always volunteer to pray. And we love these long flowery, flowery prayers ourselves and something in us just loves sounding so spiritual. We think we're really good at it, right? It's like, well, just make, sh make sure you're, you're cool about that. that. That can get real weird real, real fast. And some of us don't do this in public, but some of us do this in private. Some of us are tempted to turn our prayers with our children into performative prayers, right? not necessarily like showing them how spiritual we are, but sometimes showing them how spiritual they aren't. I say, God, I, I pray for little Dougie here that you would teach him how good it is to obey his mom and dad. God, I know that he's struggling with whether or not what he did today was a good thing. Let him know it was a bad thing he did today. Right, is that a prayer? Like, I feel like if Jesus was in the room listening, he'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. This is a private moment you're trying to have with your child. Did you need something from me while I'm here? Not a performance, more of a prayer lecture. This is, this is the side of the coin, or the one of the two illustrations Jesus gives. It's probably more linked with those of us who've been coming to church for a while. Because there's probably the other, other half of us who are newer to church or newer to faith who are like, I don't struggle with this because I will never pray out loud <laughs> in front of other people, right? But the moment we open our mouth and start to pray in front of others, this, this seed can start affecting us. And it's not always bad. Right? There, are, there are moments in Jesus' prayer life where he says things like, Father, I'm not necessarily saying this for you. I'm trying to speak for all these other people who are listening, right? That happens sometimes, but it can be easy to turn our prayers from a, a vertical conversation into a, a conversation that's primarily horizontal in nature. And this can affect all of us. I think of people like me who stand up and teach the Bible in a number of different contexts even here at this church. And, and one of the things that's tempting when you're a Bible teacher is, is to do one of two things with the closing prayer after your message. Number one, you were so terrified to publicly speak in front of this whole audience, you just wanna get off of the platform as quickly as possible. So you're not even thinking about anything you're saying, you're just trying to land the plane. The other thing that can be tempting to do is realize in your prayer that, oh no, I missed something in my message. I'm gonna pray or preach it right now. All right, listen for this today, see if I do it. All right, God, as we close this sermon, another thing that I think that we all should know about is that prayer is also a powerful weapon. All right? And there's a temptation, right? Not evil, that's not like the sin in my heart doing that when I do that. It's, but for me, it's this, I've forgotten who I'm talking to. I've forgotten the purpose of prayer. And I've forgotten that prayer is supposed to be primarily a vertical conversation, not a horizontal conversation. It can be tempting to turn our prayers into performance. Jesus gives us the antidote explicitly here in the text. He says, instead of doing this, here's how to solve this problem. He says, when you pray as my disciples, 
Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. As if you struggle with praying for all the people you see around you, like, you know, for their benefit. Instead, go pray to the Father who's unseen. Have a private moment with the Lord. The question that I put on your outlines to to wrestle with, to kind of help break the the bond of this badness of prayer practice, is, is this question, would you be willing to develop a practice of private prayer? Or maybe it's as literal as finding some time this week to go into your room, like Jesus said literally, close the door and praying to your unseen heavenly father. Maybe it doesn't have to be that literal. Maybe it's just going on a walk, getting away from it all, and just having a conversation with God. I think there's something to going in our room and closing our doors, but at the same time, I I think part of that is a metaphor. We're private, we're connecting with God and God alone, and if we are distracted by all these other things, or if we're tempted to get glory from all these other things, develop a practice where you're privately connecting with the Lord in prayer, because that's its primary purpose. I've had a lot of different rhythms of, of prayer in my own life, and, and a lot of them have been life-giving in different ways. And sometimes I journal, which is not my favorite thing to do, but every once in a while I get motivated and I start journaling, and, and God meets me in my journaling in, in a beautiful way. Other times I love going on walks, like I mentioned, and, and conversing with the Lord and wrestling with something with him. I've had moments where I've just gotten on my knees and just poured out my heart before God, and I'm going through something really hard. I've wrestled with the Lord. I've sought prayer from others. There's all these different practices I've had, And I remember one time I I studied this passage and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna apply this literally. And so I I started just keeping tabs all week long on, or all day long every day on what I needed from God. And this felt so foreign and so weird, but I would write it down in my phone or on a notebook, I don't even remember. But then once a day I would go into my room, literally, I would close the door, literally, and I'd kind of stand before God like he was my boss or something and saying, "Um, God, I've got a list of things I need from you today and here's what those seven things are. And I would just list them off. And it felt so weird, so impersonal, so transactional. At first, I didn't like it. But but here's the crazy thing. Like three, four days in, I started realizing that God was just answering every single prayer in these crazy ways. And it unlocked this thing in my mind of, oh, wow, there is a time and a place to just come to God and say, this is what I need. I was imagining if you were at work 10 a.m. tomorrow, and in the midst of whatever you were doing, your boss comes up to you and says, hey, I... I, I see what you're doing and I love it and I want to give you an invitation. Anything you need, anything you need to be more successful in your role here, just ask me and I will give it to you, I promise. And this is what Jesus says, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Right, that's a powerful promise and it feels like something that you would start racking your mind and saying, I, I want to leverage this promise. I want to figure out how to get into those conversations because I have a ton of needs as I walk about my day. Now, this image of your boss giving you that invitation also shows kind of how grotesque these two pictures of what not to do are in Jesus' passage here. Because imagine if your boss came to you and said, I'll give you anything, just ask me for it. And you took it to heart and... And then the next time you were at a meeting with your entire company, you raised your hand. No one else's hand is up, but your hand is up. And your boss is like, yeah, Carl, what's up, Carl? Like, remember last week when you told me I can ask you for anything and you give it to me? It's like, yes, Carl. I would love a $30,000 raise. Can I? Or our team needs some more resources. Whatever it is. It could be whatever it is. If you were, like that would get awkward pretty quick if you were watching. And if you knew the conversation that had happened between the boss and Carl behind the scenes, you would feel like this is all kind of icky, right? Is, Is he doing this to get attention? Is he doing this to show the rest of us he has some special relationship with the boss? Is he doing this to like, put the boss in a corner because now he can't deny his own personal raise? What? This is just yucky. And I think some of those on the surface things that we might think if we saw that in real life shows us why Jesus says, don't turn your prayer into some performance in front of the world. It's, I've told you you can have whatever you want. Just come to me, close the door, come into my office and ask me for whatever you need. 
And at the same time, I think part of the reason that you might stand up, if you're Carl, no offense if that's your name, if you're Carl and you stand up in that meeting, is there might be a deeper reason. You might be standing there and you hear what your boss is saying, but you don't actually trust that your boss is going to give you what you actually need if you don't put them in a corner and ask them in public. And I think this is a little bit more closely related to the heart of the what not to do in the second picture Jesus gives us. Where he says that when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. You know, first you picture like Elijah and the prophets of Baal where these prophets are just trying to conjure up their God's attention. They're cutting themselves, they're chanting, they're doing all these things just trying to get the attention of their God. And Elijah steps forth and just says, hey, when I call on my God, I can do it very simply. I don't need to like wave down his attention. My God is not sleeping. My God is not other, otherwise occupied. My God is always attentive. And so Jesus says, don't keep babbling thinking you need to get God's Attention, I think that what he's trying to do at the heart of this is, is show us the second temptation that can come to us when it comes to our prayer lives, which is that we can be tempted to believe that God is not listening when we pray. That's part of the reason we might ask in the public environment. <laughs> That's part of the reason that we might wanna put our boss, so to speak, on his heels is because we don't trust he's actually going to answer us because we're not sure if he really meant it when he made the promise or we're not even really sure if he's paying attention to us when we pray. You ever had a season where it just feels like your prayers are, are bouncing off the ceiling? Or, or a season where you've got something big in your life and you keep pouring out your heart to the Father and it just feels like he is not answering? And it can be tempting in that season to do one of two things. Number one is to stop praying altogether. And number two, to think, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe you need to shout louder. Maybe you need to pray harder. Maybe to say the name of Jesus more. Maybe there's some formula that I haven't figured out. Maybe I just need to do something to get his attention. Because it doesn't feel like I'm getting his attention with what I'm doing right now. If you've been in a season like that, if you are in a season like that, the question that we can bring out this, te this text is, well, what's the remedy in that case? If I feel like I need to get God's attention because he's not listening to me, what, what can we learn from this passage that can help us to kind of break the hardness of our heart when it comes to this issue? I see the answer as I, I look through this text in a, a number of different ways, kind of in everything that Jesus says. First, when he says that we should have a private prayer practice, he says, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When he tells us not to keep babbling like the pagans, he says, don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then next week as we move into the Lord's prayer, we see that Jesus dials in this image he wants us to have seared in our mind that God is our heavenly father. So if you're in a place where you're wondering, are my prayers being heard? What happens when God doesn't answer? Why is it that they're bouncing off the ceiling? Do I need to conjure up his attention? Here's the question that can kind of open the door to the remedy. It's can you trust that God sees you, hears you, and knows what you need? Can you trust that God hears you, sees you, and knows what you need? This is a question that you can bring into a prayer time when it feels like your prayers are being unanswered. I know God sees me and hears me and knows me. So God, what is going on here? It's not that you're not listening, but you're saying no, it seems. What is this? And Jesus gives us this image of God as our heavenly father. And part of the reason that he uses this image as our heavenly father is to show us the immediate access we have into his presence at all times. This morning after the, the early service, I was in the lobby talking to people, and this happened like four times. I'm talking to somebody, and we're having a conversation, and then one of my children, happened four times because I have six children, one of my children runs up between the two of us and starts hugging me and talking to me. And what I did not do is push the child away. What I did do was immediately start ignoring the person in our church and talking to my kid. And I do that every single time. My kid runs up to me, I hope you don't mind. I have never, I do this every week, I have never had someone say to one of my children, excuse me, we were talking here. 
Because everybody knows that the children, the children of a person have immediate access to them at all times. I think this is part of what Jesus is trying to give us the picture of, is that God is our heavenly father, and, and he hears us, he sees us, he is available for us at all times, whether the answer is yes, or the answer is no, or the answer is wait, or the answer is let's wrestle, he sees us, he hears us, he knows what we need before we even ask him. And so as we close our t- a time together, the, the, the image that I wanna give you that sums up this whole thing about God is that our heavenly father has designed prayer as a practice that grows us in our faith. And not just like as a discipleship endeavor, like, oh, we designed this Daniel study to grow you in your faith. But but I mean that as a father helps a child to grow, prayer is the practice that God has given us to help us grow and develop in our, our maturity as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Prayer does a lot of things, and we'll close with three things that prayer does. Number one, prayer develops dependency. Develops dependency. If you have a baby at home and you're getting irritated because your baby is always crying because they're always hungry, <laughs> babies cry out when they're hungry because they're dependent on you to feed them. If you have a teenager who never talks to you instead of when he, except when he wants or needs something, the beautiful thing about that is if your child calls you when he wants or needs something, it's because your child is dependent on you and knows that you are the only one with the love and the resources to provide for them in that moment. Right, we're trying to help our children become independent, but at the same time, we realize that our children are dependent on us, and there's, there's codependence, there's independence, and there's a beautiful dependence where kids are supposed to know, this is my mom, this is my dad, and I need them to survive. Prayer creates dependence. Even in these moments when we come to God and it seems like the answer is no, week after week, year after year, part of the rhythm of coming to him and wrestling with him is it creates this dependence on him where we're just saying, God, I know you're saying no, honestly, but you're the only one who can do this and so I'm coming to you again. Are you sure? Because I think you want this person to experience healing. I think you want this relationship to be restored. There's something that even that conversation does that develops dependence. That's what prayer does. The second thing that we see that prayer does is that prayer develops wisdom. Develops wisdom. If you've got a four-year-old who asks a thousand questions, it's because they're trying to figure out how this world works. If you're struggling with something as an adult in life and you pick up the phone and you call your aging mother or father and say, what do you think I should do? Should I sign this deal? Should I buy this car? Should I move? Should I relocate? How do I treat my, my child when they're going through this season? We reach out to our adult parents as adults because those conversations continue to develop wisdom. We know that they have gone around the block a few times and they can help us to understand a better way to see the situation that we might see otherwise. Now, again, this happens with unanswered prayers that as we see the answer is no year after year, sometimes we say, I hear people say this all the time, I'm so glad God didn't answer that prayer because he had something so much better for me on the other side. Through this wrestling with God, I developed wisdom. And, and lest we think that prayer is all about merely changing ourselves, the last thing for you to write down today is that prayer also changes the world. Prayer changes the world. This comes back to prayer as the ultimate life hack. Because Jesus says, if you have faith, only a little bit of faith, and God compels you to pray to a mountain to jump into the sea, it will. Prayer can change the world. So part of the practice of prayer is realizing that God has put some burdens on your heart because he wants you to bring them into his throne room so that he can respond. And in partnership with you, he's chosen to change the world outside of yourself. And so many of us have stories in our life of, of God moving mountains, so to speak, in impossible prayers. And a few weeks ago before Easter, we, we asked any of you who had prayer for people you're inviting to our Easter services to submit them on our Three Crosses app. And a bunch of people submitted prayer requests. And so we took them to our elders and our pastors and said, hey, let's, let's pray for these people in our church. And, and a few weeks later, I got a note from someone that we had prayed for. And she said, man, I've been inviting my spouse to church for 25 years. He says, no, every year. And then I felt compelled to bring this request to our church leadership and you guys prayed for me and this year for the first time in 25 years of marriage, he said yes and it wasn't even, a, it wasn't even hard to convince him. But prayer changes people's hearts. It changed the world outside our doors. You know, small things, big things, medium things. Small things, the other day I was, 
I was wrestling with a conversation I needed to have with someone. I didn't know how to step into the conversation. I prayed, God, just let them text me today so I can respond and start the conversation. Within three minutes, this random person texted me out of the blue. It changes things. We're praying for somebody on our ministry team here who's uh, had as a parent who's gone through some really, really hard medical stuff that just no end in sight looked really bleak. And so we prayed and a few weeks later we say, hey, what's the update? She said, well, it seems like everything bad has gone away and been resolved. Prayer is the only answer. I talk to people all the time who said, my doctor says, keep praying because she doesn't know what's happening to my body. (laughs) Prayer changes us. And prayer gives us comfort when God says no. But prayer changes the world. So I want to pray for us, but I want to commission you to step into a practice this week of private prayer. And whether it's two minutes a day or 20 minutes a day, whatever is next for you, just trust that when you go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Your Father who sees and hears what is done in secret, he rewards us. Let's go to him in prayer right now. Lord, help us to have the faith to know that you do hear our prayers. For those in this room maybe who are struggling because of unanswered prayers, we pray that that would not get in the way of them bringing their requests to you. For those of us who maybe have been neutral in our prayer lives or not connecting with you regularly. We pray that you would energize us this week to just build a basic and small, quiet, private practice of simply bringing our requests to you. Let us grow in the rhythm of of sensing our needs and realizing you are the one who meets our needs. And so like newborn children, let us cry out to you as the one on whom we are dependent for life itself. I pray for anyone who doesn't know you, doesn't have that relationship, that they would realize that our relationship with you is only a prayer away. They would come to you for forgiveness of their sin, come to you for newness of life, come to you because you are the one who died for their sins and rose to new life. And let them step into relationship with you even today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.